Sometimes in your life, you, you will get caught in something that's already in motion in the plan of God. And how you respond to that, how you deal with that, is a key to your participation in something that's already been decreed and in motion by the plan of God. Now, let me tell you why that's important. I suppose that probably every one of you is familiar with Romans 8, 28. If you're not, you should. You, you know this passage, all things work together for good to those who love God, right? Those who are called according to his purpose or will, his plan. You know what he's saying when he says that to you? Be sure you adjust because it's already in motion. It's moving through and your life is, life is caught up in it in a most significant way. There's probably no one here today that that's not true of. I could be speaking a little bit out of the realm because maybe not all of you are spiritually advancing believers, but I'm going to assume that. And if you are, the majority of the time in your life, the will of God is in movement through your life. It's in, it's in movement, and God desires your participation in it. And sometimes it's how you respond to an event that's very important. And Joseph is struggling in the midst of that and doesn't realize it. I mean, he's struggling, but he doesn't realize that he's struggling against the plan of God. Because when he chooses to assume that Mary has committed adultery and is pregnant and he should get a divorce, if he stays on that course, if he stays on that path, if he keeps traveling down that wrong road, he's going to start working against the plan of God, which he is not doing right now. He doesn't, he doesn't realize it. Gabriel's been sent to reveal to him, and that's God's divine intervention, and he'll do that with you if, you're positive, if you have positive volition as a spiritually advanced believer, if you have positive volition to doing the will of God, if you're off course, he will, he will do whatever's necessary to bring you back on course in a gentle, wonderful teaching way because you're positive. I thought I was doing the right thing. I looked at the scriptures. Yes, but you had a false assumption, Joseph. I didn't know it at the time. Let me tell you, your heavenly father knows that. And your heavenly father will take the responsibility to get you off the path, get you back on the right path. That's what he did for Joseph, didn't he? It's important you see that today. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into it. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit the privilege to confess sin. Why? Well... You can't study the Bible in carnality. You can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin is dealt with by 1 John 1, 9, among many texts. But that's the one we use around here. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That restores us to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You will need the Holy Spirit to get a hold of this. Both Mary, the importance of the Holy Spirit in Mary's life, wow. The importance of the Holy Spirit in Joseph's life, wow. One dealing with the physical, one dealing with the spiritual. Both of them, in fact, dealing with spiritual issues. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way today by the automobile and by the Internet. And we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth today of what do we do when God's will is in motion and we're swept along in it and then begin to struggle with it. 
how, how, do we, how do we correct this? And if we correct it, what is our situation? And how does God deal with this? We'll see that today in the life of Joseph, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me remind you of the word day. D-E, it's a, it's a conjunction. And remember, I said it's a sequential conjunction. It's, and it's used, we use it as our outline of our Christmas story. We've used it as our outline. And I wrote at the top of your paper, every sentence that is listed, for example, verse 18 starts with a day. Verse 19, verse 20, 21, then we have 22, 23, and then we have 24, 25. We have six, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So we've used that as an outline. Uh, also, it's interesting that the way that this is sequence of day is used is also the sequence of, Greek, of the Greek sentences. Verse 18, verse 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. These are not, quote, coincidence in writing. And so you, you look for these kind of markers when you study the Greek language. You look for these kind of markers. Sometimes they're, they're there and sometimes they're not. Sometimes the markers, markers are not all grammatical like this one is, but this one's very clear. And I'll tell you something. If you'll pay attention to the word, well, I don't know. You don't, <laughs> if you don't know the Greek language, but... The way Matthew opens his book with the word day you, and it's translated now in the English is really important to the book of Matthew. You, if there are no other reason, just pay attention to how, many, how chapters are opened or whatever by the word now. But anyhow, that's just... And so today we're talking about the fourth day D-E, the conjunction fourth. We're looking at verse 21. We're looking at verse 21. And I also find it interesting uh, today. Gabriel's message to Joseph, I'm assuming it's Gabriel because he's the birth story guy of Messiah. Gabriel's message is, is in a dream, right? In a dream. That was old covenant, ways God works in the old covenant. In fact, what is interesting to me when you study the life of Joseph and you, you begin to do that after you do a couple Christmas series, everything is about Mary and Jesus. And so you go like, well, he's kind of left out here. And so you get interested in a guy like Joseph. Joseph never speaks. He never speaks. I guess he could. <laughs> But he never speaks. You, you'll never hear it. When, when, when Gabriel shows up with uh, Mary, uh, she's a chatty Cathy. You know, how, you know that? Eh. He shows up to Joseph. Joseph goes like, when he is through talking, he just salutes and drives forward. He never talks. You never see him talk at all, ever. Out. And yet God speaks to him. And every time God speaks to Joseph, he speaks to him in dreams. That's interesting. For example, if you read his life in Matthew 1, 20 through 24, as we are studying right now, it's about Mary. He speaks to Joseph in a dream about Mary. In the second chapter of Matthew, verses 13 through 15, he speaks to Joseph in a dream about Herod, who wants to kill the kids. When he speaks to Joseph again, he speaks to Joseph in a dream. In the second chapter, 19 through 20, in Egypt, he tells him it's time to go home because Herod is dead. When he's in, in Matthew, the second chapter, verses 22 through 20, it's all on your paper. On 22, 23, he tells him when you go back home, he tells him in a dream, when you go back home, I don't want you to go back to where you were. I want you to go back to Nazareth. All of that done in a dream. Isn't that interesting? There's probably more to Joseph than you might think. He gives very little print, so I'm trying to give him a little bit today. When you look at the book of Luke, and Luke talks about Joseph, the last time that we actually see Joseph is in Luke, the second chapter, 
I put down verse 41 through 48 for you. This is when Jesus was, we believe, 12 years old, and he was in the temple and discussing with the scholars. You remember that? You know what it says? It's, it says his parents were looking for him. And when they found him, they said, Mary said to him, you know, you shouldn't be doing this to your mother and your father. And so we see him, evidence there. In Luke, the third chapter, in the genealogy of it, in verse 23, Joseph is declared in genealogy, in genealogy, not in real life time, but in genealogy, and he is connected with Jesus at the age of about 30. But we don't know if he's still alive because after this, Joseph disappears from the pages. But we know he was actively involved up to the up Jesus age of 12. We know that for sure. But after, quote, Jesus is 30, we don't find him. So we don't find him at all. We find Mary and we find, we find the rest, rest of the members of the family. But we don't find him. So I find Joseph to be kind of an interesting guy, uh, at least for me. I want you to, in our... In our verse 21, I want you to pay attention to what we call future declaratives. Future declaratives. Notice that on my introduction, pay attention to the three declaratives regarding Mary's pregnancy and what Joseph will miss if he divorces Mary on a false charge of adultery. I found that to be interesting. When God lays the plan out, he tells you why you should participate in it, and he tells you what you'll miss if you don't. Isn't that interesting? For example, he says, I want you, if you agree to participate, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call his name Jesus and then tells him what the mission is. For he, say, he will save his people from their sins. Not just save their people from the muck and mire of the world. He says he will save their, he will save their people from their sins. Not just from their sicknesses and not from their reversion. Not just for all of that. He will save them from their sins. <clears throat> and so he tells Joseph why he should participate in the plan of God. You're on the wrong road. Get back here on the right road. And if you do, I'm going to tell you what you're going to get to see. You're going to get to participate I, immediately. The next step, listen, he tells him what the next thing he wants him to do. You know what the next thing he wants to do is six months away. The next thing on the docket, if you say yes, Joseph, if you agree to participate, the next thing on the docket for you is I want you to name him Jesus. And I want you to tell the people why. And he gives, God gives him a, a divine definition of the name Jesus. He puts a, a whole religious slant to it. For he will save his people from their sins is the definition. He takes a, he takes a name and takes it completely out of the context of the old covenant way of thinking it and gives it a new meaning for the new covenant. Therefore, Jesus is not going to be a name like the old covenant. It's going to be a name nothing like the old covenant. It's going to be a name that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow above the earth, on the earth, and beneath the earth. That's a new meaning to that name. And so this message that Gabriel brings to him is a pretty powerful message like the one I bring to you today. It depends on what you do with it. All I am is a messenger, but I can tell you it's a message of great importance to your life and you need to pay attention to me today. And so here's how Gabriel lays it out to him. This is verse 21. Notice I broke it down into the three future declaratives. Three declaratives he makes to him with main verbs. He says, and day now, 
and now, that's the, se- begins the, for- that's the fourth sequence, and now she will bear, future middle indicative, a son that's a legal, that's legal, that's a legal son, that's a, that's a weos. This is not a, a baby idea, this is a legal idea. She's going to give birth to a son, and that birth of a son has a legal, and of course he just dealt with it, that's Matthew 1 through 17. Matthew 1 through 17 is what he's referring to. Second, notice the future imperative, that's a command. And you shall call his name, notice a definite article with the word name. Listen, everybody born eighth day got a name. And people are not going to understand that Jesus is not a new name. But a new meaning to the name. Yesu. There's a definite article with it. This is the name that's going to be above every name. And it's not a name that's above every name unless you understand the divine interpretation, the divine interpretation or meaning of the name. For he shall, what? look, look. He puts it in the Cal imperative and then says, third declarative, future active indicative, he will save his people from their sins. Did you notice there was no devil article with the word son? Now, let me talk about a few things. Number one, I want you to look at, in number one, in my first point, I want you to pay attention to a couple questions I ask. First, how does a spiritually advancing believer deal with the will of God already in motion? especially when you are about to make a decision against the directive will, right? How do you deal with it? How do you deal with the will of God already in motion? That's what this whole, this whole message to Gabriel and what my lesson's about is to bring that to clarity in your soul, to bring it clarity in your life. Because listen, you're going to run across. Listen, this is going to go. This, if you're a spiritually advancing believer, you're, the will of God is always in motion with you. That's why Romans 8, 28 is so important. And you don't want to be playing catch up. You want to be able to, you want to be able just to go with the flow. Make all the adjustments you need to make and make them quickly and move with the flow. Because God has you in it to participate in fulfillment of the will of God. I mean, this is your Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays. This is not like one or two things in a lifetime. Listen, he's talking about the will of God has already been in motion for three months. It, and listen, I want you to participate. And if you do, I've got something for you six months down the road that's really important. And the plan of God has been decreed. Right? So you have no idea. You're always in adjustment to the will of God. All things work together for good. You're always in that frame of mindset. All things work together for good to those who love God that are called according to his purpose or his will. You're always in adjustment. This is not something that just booms in. You're moving along and all of a sudden you go to the doctor and he says, you got your wanga ganga. And now there's an adjustment. Listen, you had Wanga Ganga before you ever got to the doctor's office. The thing's in motion. It's how you adjust and what you do and what God is going to do with that is what's important. This is the, this is the message to the Christian life. This is the way we live the Christian life. If you're a spiritually advancing believer, you, therefore things don't shock you. Your world is not rocked. You understand that they just, it just flows. And the future tense says it flows with your destiny in hand, right? All of these are future tenses. All of them are future tenses. Given to the person in the now. I just find that to be extremely interesting. 
another question. How will Joseph respond to the directive will of God that's already in motion when he's in opposition mode? How will he, how will he do that? We all get caught in counselings like this. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> you can't change it. I mean, you don't want to. This, this is the movement. This is the will of God in movement through your life. This is one thing I liked about Joseph. He stayed positive towards the directive will of God. Listen to me. Even though he was traveling down the wrong road, how do I know it? Because when he revealed, hey, you should, have, you should have hung a left back there at the fork and you took a right. You should have hung a left. Now you're two miles down the road or we might stay three miles since she's three months. Three miles down the road. Will he have the courage to reverse his travel? We used to call it a U-turn, Bill. Remember the U-turn? We had one street in Little Shelby. Right, there's how we went. Well, you did a U-turn today, they'd put you in prison. That's how we lived on the farm, little town. But he's got to do a U-turn. He's got to do it. He's, he's got to find a place to turn around and go back to the fork and take the right road. The question is, will you be willing? Are you going to be so, are you going to be so bullheaded? And, well, I've made my choice and I've made my decision. And I've told three or four people or maybe three or four hundred people. I'm getting divorced in the morning. I got a nine o'clock appointment. Yeah, but you, look, you're three miles down the wrong road. Will you do a U-turn and come back to the fork and go on the right road? I don't know. It's a volitional choice, isn't it? But I'm going to tell you what, if you do, here's, a, here's a two more future tenses for you. <laughs> if you don't, then we're going to put discipline on you. There's no, no discipline on you right now. You've made an honest, you've made an honest mistake. Which are no such sayings. They're choices. They're no mistakes. They're choices. Will he do it? That's the question. Gabriel, Gabriel's been sent to tell him his choices. Do a U-turn and go back to the fort, take the right road. Will he do it? I don't know. Maybe he might. He hasn't realized he's, running, he's going down the wrong road, right? He hasn't realized it. When he now realizes it, will he reverse? Will he do a U-turn and go back? I don't know. G Gabriel doesn't know. You know who does? God Almighty. God Almighty knows because he's omniscient. Jacob don't, uh, Joseph don't know, and Gabriel don't, I suppose. Now here, I'm a bottom line guy. The directive will of God regarding Mary's pregnancy has already been in motion for three months. If God shows, this is what I think goes on with a guy like this, what goes on with us. If God shows you the right road, will you travel down it, yes or no? You know, He's three miles down on a nine-mile trip. Are you with me? Nine months. He's three, he's three miles down on a, on a nine-mile trip. Are you with me? Please tell me you know three months and nine months. Okay. You make me work a little harder for this. He's three, he's three down, but he's going nine, right? I mean, that's the road in the will of God. Will he, will, he do a, will he do a U-turn and go back? Here's what, here's what Gabriel says. If you do, when you get to the nine miles on the right road, you'll call his name Jesus because there will be a birth of Christ. See, that's about destiny, isn't it? 
God said, look, son, son, you've made an eye. Listen, let's correct it. Let's do a U-turn. Let's get back. Let's get back. Oh, I know you've lost three miles, but you haven't lost everything. Come on. Let's get back here. Let's go down. Let's go down this pike. And he tells him, he tells him, if you say yes, if yes, Joseph will need to reverse his viewpoint of Mary's pregnancy and divorce. Then Joseph can decide to go with it or go against it. Agreed? Yeah. It's kind of like Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Okay, let's have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, you ever have one of those with God? Let me have one of these conversations, buddy. I had one. Changed my course. Changed my course of life as a, as a spiritually advancing believer. I had that conversation with him. You're going to keep going the way you are? You're going to do a reverse and get this thing done? If you do, this is what you'll have. And if you don't, mm. I never was a guy that liked that if you don't. Joseph, listen, here it is. Joseph must understand and accept that the directive will of God has been in motion three months. Joseph must understand and accept that is six months still to go to the birth of the Messiah. Joseph must understand and accept that it has been divinely decreed that's already in motion. What is in motion has been divinely decreed. Ephesians 5 17, you should write in your Bible because you're going to need this to do the U-turn. <laughs> when God stops you, listen, I've been in, I've been in premarital counseling with people, right down to invitations being sent out. We had our final session. They were do homework and came in and they went, we shouldn't be getting married. And I went, you got that right. I wanted to hear it from their lips because they were about to hear it from mine. And you know what they did? They did a U-turn. And they spared two people a, a miserable life by haul, sending back everything that they had gotten and telling everybody. You know, those were tough calls. Here's what Ephesians 5.17 says at the bottom here. So then, do not be foolish. Now watch what it's about. Could we all have a tendency to be foolish? Don't be foolish. Listen to this. When it's important to understand, don't be foolish. When the options are there, the choices are there, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. Don't be foolish. You figure out what the will of God is. You sit down on it. And if you're on the wrong path, God is responsible to correct it. He will send a teaching angel to your life. You understand? He will send somebody that can give you the word of God with clarity on an issue that is vitally important to your life. Because God is faithful. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. You know, it was that very principle of don't be foolish that got me saved. I heard the gospel, and it was given with judgment as well as sin. It, it was given with, with the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And judgment fell all over me. And I said, don't be stupid, Ron. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. And so I believe the gospel of Christ in my life was forever changed. So it's an important verse for your life. Don't be foolish. We're all going to have these opportunities flowing. Spiritual advancing believers, the word of God is always in motion. And you step into it. And he, wants, he wants involvement in it. And don't be foolish when you think, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't be foolish. When you understand it, embrace it. It is the will of God. It is the will of God. Here's point number two. Joseph might have thought to himself by inner dialogue, 
Look, I didn't sign up for all of this when I asked her to marry me, right? That's the stuff I hear. I didn't, I didn't sign up for all this stuff when I asked her to marry me. Yes, Joseph. Yes, Joseph, that is true. But God did it. Yes, that's true. That's true, Joseph. I couldn't agree with you more. But God did it. Now what are you going to do? Right? That's true, Joseph. You didn't sign up. I understand that. I understand that. But God did. He signed you up. <laughs> God did it. That's Romans 8, 28. Do you know what you miss in, in Romans 8, 28? You know what you miss? You miss 29 and 30. So let me show you what you miss. Now, I like you quoting it, but make sure you stay in context with it. Because there's a, what verse 29 and 30 says is lights out. I, that's a positive statement, by the way. Here's Romans. Listen to this. Now, you know this, but I'm bringing it into context in his life. You know, verse 28. Well, let me just read it because it goes on. For we know that we, for we know, <laughs> for we know, that's we understand except this principle of doctrine. We know that God causes all things to work together for good, those who love God, to those, notice the word, to those, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now watch his called according to his purpose is what Joseph has gotten caught into. Agreed? So this, listen, you too. Your life is filled with these episodes. These are events and episodes in the plan of God. The plan of God moves along and you're caught in the stream of it if you're a positive volitional guy. Listen, God's been working on this for 700 years, Joseph. You've been, you've been working on this about two weeks. Do you understand the will of God in motion? This is Isaiah 714. <laughs> it's true in your life and mine. When we're caught as spiritual, positive, spiritually advancing believers, we're caught in the, the plan of God as it's moving along. We're caught, to, per, caught in it to participate in it. And it's something that's been mowing. And nine times out of ten, it's something that's all been ready to create in your life. Accept it as part of your destiny. It's the future tense. Here's what verse 29 says. For whom he foreknew. When Joseph got caught in this, he got caught into something that had been, been planned out since the beginning of time, but put in, put in pro prophetic key, a virgin shall have, be conceived of the spirit. Put that in way back here with Isaiah, 8th century BC, is coming to, to have impact on a generation of people right now. That's true with your life and mine. We're the will of the will of plan of God has been carried is carrying it's moving steadily through human history and we get a chance to participate in in our little time capsule. You know, people say to me, Ron, why do you why do you think it's so important right now to do all these things? Are you kidding me? We're a time capsule. We only have an allotted amount of time to get things done that's on our plate. And we're caught in the midst of the plan of God moving. You got to be ready to think on your feet, moving destiny. You know, when it says way down the Lord, listen, we're in a time capsule when we say that. Way down the Lord. You're going to wait 700 years on him, huh? 
You think you got 700 years? The only person that's got 700 years in your life is God Almighty. You don't have 700 years. But you do have some years. And God wants them. He wants your years. And listen, if, you, if he gets your ears, he'll get your years. Let me tell you, I tell you, as your pastor, he wants it worse than anything that you could imagine. You want to give God a Christmas gift? Give him that. So here he says, for, for whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, and whom he predestined, these he called, and whom he called, these he, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. Do you realize that's the system moving through your life? That is the system. When you say in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for me in the plan of God. This is stuff that's foreknown, predestined. It, 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 you're part of an enormous system. And you can, you can tap into that foreknowledge. You can tap into that predestined. You can tap into that just, you can tap into all those when you flow with the plan of God. Oh, I wish that for you. I wish that with all of my heart for you. It can be trying experiences in this event, like with Joseph, or with like Jesus in Gethsemane. They're not always easy choices. They're not always easy things to do, but they're the right thing, the right thing, not the wrong And you can know when you do the right and the right is the will of God with clarity, then you know God will back every bit of it. God will back every bit of it. He's not going to put something in motion for 700 years that's going to falter in your hands. You can be assured that he, when he calls on Joseph to participate in this event in the 700-year program that is now time to come to fulfillment, that he will see and he'll walk him. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will walk you through this, Joseph. I will walk you through it, but you got to get back on the right road. I can't walk the road you're walking, Joseph. I can't walk the road you're walking. You're walking in the wrong direction. This is why we come to this church. This is why we come to this church. This is why we drive past other churches to get here. This is why when this church moves to any other location, this is why you drive and you go to it. You sit with other people who are positive with volition. You sit with other people that are hungry, that are traveling down the road and want to get back on the right road. You travel with them. You encourage him. And let me tell you, there are a lot of hungry people out there. Let me tell you, there are a lot of hungry people out there. They may not be in our community, but there are a lot of hungry people out there. I meet with them every week. I stopped for a cup of coffee today at a local restaurant just to get my bearings. The guy who runs it, I go there every Sunday. Mine shuts down. So he sees me come and study the Bible, go over that, and he knows I'm a pastor. Comes back and he says, I know. You have but just a minute. I could see he was distraught. He said, I am having marital problems. I said, sit down. (laughs) 
a believer? Yeah. Caught in something? Yeah. Just like Joseph. He was just like Joseph. I thought, isn't it interesting God used it? A guy would come to me and sit down that was a Joseph. Says, so can you just give me five minutes? I went, yeah. And he was Joseph. He was Joseph. He was Joseph. He talked like Joseph. He looked like Joseph to me. I went, Joseph. couldn't possibly help him in five or ten minutes, could you? But it was an open door, wasn't it? And it was that opportunity to share with him, to give him a card and tell him where to go, to tell him if you really are interested in what I've got a little bit to say, you go on our website, you look up everything on marriage. If you want to talk some more, I'm the guy. I, you, look, I'll come back and visit with you, but not on your time. You clocked in. You give the guy, you give your boss what he pays you for. On your time, I will give you mine. I'll give you my time. But I don't want you to give your boss time. If you like what I got to say, and you should, then I'll come back and talk to you. But on your time, you got to give me your time. Here I was studying Joseph. Was I not prepared? <sighs> he sat down and he was Joseph all over again. He was about to make the wrong decisions. He was traveling down the wrong road. We meet people like this every week in our life, don't we? I'm not the only guy that does this. I'm the only guy that's got the pulpit to talk about it today. Boy, do I have the answers for his life. Do I have the answers for his life? But I can't give it to him. It's not a fast fooder. It's, it's, not, it's not microwaving. I can't microwave it for you. Could you do this in 10 seconds? No, but I can do it. I can do it. See, the question is, and then I'm going to close. The rest of it is up to you. My other question, will Joseph leave the decision to divorce and, and, and take the decision to marry Mary, to take Mary as his wife? Will he do that? Will he, will he abandon that road that he's on, that he feels so confident about, feels so assured that he's doing the right thing? When it's declared he's not doing the right thing, he's doing the wrong thing, will he do a U-turn and come back to the fork and go on the other road? Will he abandon the wrong road? When he was so confident it was right. And I love the way Gabriel gave it to him. You know how he gave it to him? He gave the word of God. He didn't give hunches. He didn't give him hunches. He gave him the word of God. He gave him Isaiah 7, 14 and explained it. And he said, this is the reality in your life right now. What you're experiencing is so important to Isaiah 7, 14, 700 years of God waiting to bring it to fulfillment. And Joseph, it's in your hands if you want to participate. You can be the man. Do you remember, how, you, can you imagine how many men 
over 700 years that loved God with all their heart, soul, and mind would have loved to have been that man that declared for God to the world that this is Jesus, for he has come to save his people from their sins. Can you imagine how many men would have loved that privilege? And it was given to Joseph, who was traveling on the wrong road. An opportunity to do a U-turn and come back and fulfill the will of God on something that had been in movement for 700 years and only three months in his life. I want you to have eyes to see that because if you're a spiritually advancing believer like I think you are, then you, this will of God is in motion in your life and you got to pay attention to it. You can always pay attention to it when you say, why me or why this or why that? And then you, you're reminded all things work together for good. Those who, called according, those who love him are called according to his purpose or will. The divine, the divine plan of God is always revealed to you by the directive will of God. And then it begins to move in directions as I state on your paper. As I state on your paper. I'm going to close with Acts 4, 12. Listen to what this says. Because this is all about the mission that Gabriel came to declare. There is no salvation in no one else. Boy, is that strong. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which he must be saved. John would have declared in 1 John 2.2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. If you're part of the whole world today, let me tell you what you need to do. Because this Christmas is about Christ. It's about the worship of Christ, Christ's mass. It's about the worship of Christ. The wise men were smart enough. Wise men True wise men believe that Christ came to die on that cross, be buried and raised from the dead. And by believing that gospel, it has the power of God to save those who believe. If you're anywhere in this world today, I'm going to ask you to do that. If you're in this congregation today and you've never done that, you think if you sat in church, you're going to be okay. <laughs> Jeez. No more than sitting in a garage and become a car. It's not going to. But I'll tell you what, it can happen. In a split second of time, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can be part of the family of God for time and eternity. And it's a gift. Merry Christmas. It's a gift. And it's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and so, our Father, we thank you today. Joseph has reminded us of a lot of things today, Father, for our souls of this Christmas. I tell you, Father, the wonderful part of this story is that Joseph did a U-turn. Oh. Joseph did a U-turn. Got back on the right road. And not only did he listen to the message of God in one dream, but four are recorded. He wasn't a guy who talked a lot, apparently, Father. He wasn't a charismatic personality that just attracted people, and he had a lot to say, good and bad and ugly and good and all that. But I'll tell you one thing I learned about Joseph by the four dreams he responded to that he was truly a righteous man. He's truly a righteous man. He could eat crow in a second and call it the best meal he ever had when it come from God's hand. He could do a U-turn and take the hits. For a pregnancy, people didn't understand, but now he does. And he'll take a lot of hits for it. 
and he'll wear it as a badge of courage because he's no longer insecure and afraid because God has called him among all the men to father his child, to be the parent, to be the parent. And if the product is part of the parenting, then he did a good job. Well done, thy good and faithful servant, Joseph. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.